that's nice. What's up guys, it's RevJ again. I'm back out in the garage with the Hatred Copter C10 and a two and a half pound uh, fire extinguisher from Amorex. After all the hard work we've put into this thing, a little bit of protection probably is not the worst idea. These old trucks have a lot of shortcomings in terms of safety, installed lap belts only keep in mind, but a fire extinguisher is a pretty great way of preventing a potentially catastrophic situation. Why else am I talking about this? Well, I have had three situations to date in which having a fire extinguisher potentially could have made a huge difference. Thankfully, I've never been on fire, knock on wood somewhere, but I've come pretty darn close, and I'll tell you about the three situations in which having one of these might have been the difference between losing my truck or just having a little bit of damage. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about this particular fire extinguisher and why I chose it. Like I said, this is a two and a half pound fire extinguisher from Amorex. They're a pretty big company that does a lot of fire safety and supply. And this one is filled with Purple K. Now you guys probably know that there are a lot of different types of fire extinguisher ratings. You've seen the ABC, or I think it's called an all types extinguisher, as well as the A only, B only, B and C only. This is filled with Purple K, which is a dry chemical extinguisher that is B and C rated. And it, it also happens to be purple. Now, with all extinguishers, you've got sort of a give and take process and potential risks. Keep in mind, if you have to deploy this thing, something is on fire, and you have to weigh any potential risks against what could happen if you do nothing. Now, at minimum, you've seen fires you can fight with something like water, which is fine, but oil and gas fires, not good for water. So what do you do? Well, you look to the dry chemical extinguishers or the foam extinguishers. Those are your ABC extinguishers, your BC extinguishers, uh, something like Halon or Halotron, which we can talk more about later. Now those wet extinguishers, they cling on to things. The type A extinguishers will like soak into wood and it never really comes out of things like upholstery and a lot of circuitry and stuff like that. So I personally don't think that is the best choice. Uh, this B and C dry chemical has its own risks. You get dry chemical on some circuit boards, uh, depending on the exact chemical, it can corrode aluminum. But in my case, I thought that was the best way to go with a dry chemical like Purple K. Now keep in mind, this is not something designed to put out my interior issues. If I were to have carpet catch on fire or something, even though it could be used, it's not necessarily the ideal extinguisher type for that. I have this one specifically to fight the possibility of an oil or gas fire or something happening under hood, which is A, the most likely, be the greatest risk factor for damage. Uh, and you might have also heard of Halon or Halotron systems. I believe Halon is no longer allowed to be manufactured, just like things like R12. There are newer, more green-friendly chemicals that are available. However, Halon systems are still legal. They can be still sold by racing shops. If they have the stuff in stock, as far as I know, you can still test and pass Halon systems. Uh, but Halotron has replaced it. I don't know a ton about those. A lot of times Halon and Halotron are used for like the fully contained racing systems, things you permanently mount, actual fire suppression systems. They do make Halon and Halotron fire extinguishers, uh, but I don't have any experience with those. I'm just sticking to your traditional dry chemical for today. So now that I had picked out my extinguisher, I had to think about where we were going to mount it. In any case, when you mount an extinguisher, it wants to be somewhere that's going to be easy to access, not behind a locked cabinet or something like that, and something that in case of a fire, you could pull out and deploy pretty rapidly. So I took a look at a couple different options, good and bad. Uh, for example, the glove box, not the best place. Not only does it not fit, but if something were to happen and that glove box door were to get stuck, you'd have no access to your extinguisher. Not to mention behind the door stuffed in there, it's not going to be that easy to maintain and you're not going to remember to service it necessarily. And like I said, in the case of a fire and deploying, it's just not going to be that easy. I have a nice little spot in the back corner of the cab where I could easily put a little bracket and mount it there. It'd be out of the way, it'd be hidden behind my little carpet rear wall, but again, it's got something in front of it and it might be obstructed if it needs to be deployed. Also keep in mind that this extinguisher is not designed to put out like interior fires. 
So keeping it inside the interior, eh, not ideal. And if something happens while you're outside the car or somebody standing by has to grab the extinguisher, they have to then get access to the car. Now, if something crazy were to happen, or they didn't have access to the doors, or maybe a window wasn't down, or whatever, well, then that person has no access to your extinguisher. In my case, because it's a truck, my next option was to take a look at the bed, and that's what I chose, but I did look at a couple different ways of doing it. Now, personally, I like the space behind me. It's up against the front wall of the bed, right behind the driver's compartment. Why is this good? Well, one, if I need to get out in a hurry, the extinguisher's right here. I can just reach over the bed rail and grab it. Two, it's external to the vehicle, so somebody nearby could also access it in case of an emergency. My passenger or a bystander or an emergency crew. And because it's easy to access, it's going to increase the ability to maintain it, remember to pull it out and take a look at it. Which brings me to how you mount your extinguisher matters. Now in my case, I've just got a regular single strap bracket on it here, which is pretty typical for most of these, but I also went in ahead and ordered a double strap bracket. Now here's the reason for that. A lot of extinguishers are designed to be mounted vertically. Dry chemical extinguishers definitely can be mounted horizontally, but there's a precaution you've got to take really in any case with these things. Because there's a loose dry chemical in there, over time it can settle out. If you have it laying flat for a long period, that chemical can sit at the bottom and were you to discharge it in a hurry, that suction tube might miss that dry chemical compacted at the bottom, discharge the uh, nitrogen and stuff that's in there, and that's it. No fire fought. So how do you solve that? Well, what you need to do is occasionally, usually it's a good idea once a month or so, pull the thing out, flip it over, and give it a couple taps with a mallet. It's just going to loosen up the material that's in the bottom. You're not trying to whack the heck out of the thing. You're not trying to dent the casing or anything like that. You simply want to shake up the material that's in there and make sure that loose, dry chemical doesn't pack down and become useless. Now that I've got that covered, I think I'm going to choose to mount mine horizontally. That is part of the reason I got the two-strap bracket, just in case. While the one strap may be fine, it just disconnects with the single quick release, in case there was a lot of movement this way, it's only got the one support point. If I go ahead and grab the two strap bracket, again, we now have two places coming right around the extinguisher where it's gonna go ahead and wrap it around, again, preventing any movement like this. Now, I'm also gonna make sure that my nozzle is pointed down. This thing doesn't see a lot of inclement weather and it's not gonna see much behind the rail there, but if water or something were to settle in there, I don't want an obstructed orifice. Nobody does, right? I just want to make sure that that thing is nice and clean, so if I do ever have to discharge it, there's no risk of corrosion or buildup or anything in there, or water sitting up and potentially damaging the valve that retains pressure, and having this thing lose pressure over time, or, I don't know, discharge itself? Early discharge? Now that I've got my location picked out, I can go ahead and grab the bracket here, transfer a couple of these holes over, get it bolted up to the front bed panel, and strap in my new extinguisher. All right, guys, it is story time, and as I learned a long time ago, the absolute best stories are told by sketchy-looking guys wearing headbands, which also just so happens to be what I'm wearing right now. 
Uh, listen, there's about three things I can think of, whether you want to call them stories or experiences or just tales of shit that happened, uh, in which having a fire extinguisher probably would have been a very good idea. Uh, so for you guys that follow me over on social media or my build over on the 67 to 72 Chevy truck forums, I'll have links down here, you guys may have heard parts of these stories or sort of the aftermath of them and whatever. And these are all in no particular order, although if you want to rank them from best to worst, you're more than welcome to do so, I guess. So the first story is sort of a leftover story from the previous owner. Uh, when I bought this thing, it was sort of the victim of a bad late 80s, early 90s rebuild. The motor and everything in it was clean and was very nice, but the body needed a ton of work. Again, the early pages on my build will document a lot of this. Uh, and one of the things that we hadn't upgraded at that point, before the LS motor or anything was in it, was the wiring system. Now on these old trucks, there's a lot of like, you know, solid core copper wiring. Uh, there's only a couple of grounding points. There wasn't much going through them originally. There's not a lot of circuitry because again, the number of electronic options was pretty limited. And when you start adding things like aftermarket radios, and then you get into all the wiring fuel injection, well, you're putting a lot more load through some of these same existing circuits, which just may not be able to handle it. Now, the old fuse blocks on these things generally work fine when they work. It's the old glass fuse style. I don't love them, but you can still find replacements for them, and they do their job. However, from aging of the old plastics and some corrosion, as well as adding things onto like auxiliary circuits, which may or may not have been rated for it, we ran a serious fire risk. So much so that actually when we went to go ahead and do the LS swap, we pulled out the old fuse block to find out that it was pretty much completely melted. At some point, not sure exactly when, it had lit itself on fire from the back and done a pretty good job of scorching a large amount of the circuitry and melting that plastic and getting things all messed up. Now would something like the panel have gone up and caught fire? I'd have a fire extinguisher. And yes, this one specifically isn't designed for interior fires, uh, but I'll take a fire extinguisher over no fire extinguisher in that case. Now story number two is, I guess, a little worse, and it involves a little trip down to Kentucky. Now some of you guys know I like to go down to LS Fest in Bowling Green. It's a pretty fun event, and it gets larger every year. You go down, you stay in the area, you go party in Nashville, you have a good time, and then we drive back. Now that's about nine hours back, so we stopped in Indiana for some gas and got a full tank of premium. As we left the station, the truck stalled at a light. I tried to recrank it again, and it wouldn't start. My gauges all went lean. So we shut it down to a very, very significant fuel smell. That fuel smell was worsened as soon as I opened the door and literally stepped out into a puddle of raw gas. My buddy Sandwiches was with me. He went out and threw the hood open right away. And sure enough, we noticed as a state trooper drove by that the return line on the truck was actively pumping all of the fuel in the rail onto a warm header. Thankfully, we had stopped long enough at the gas station to piss and get a beverage that the engine wasn't red hot anymore. But if you look at the location of where the return line is, if it comes off, the gas has no place to go but trickle straight down over the manifold, down onto the exhaust. Not a great situation. Now, as a side note to this, this was actually the result of a failure of some fittings. This was widely publicized in a lot of forums, and the manufacturer, as far as I know, never admitted responsibility. The early push to connect fittings had the plastic retaining ring, which did not fully seat itself over the little barb on the hose, meaning under pressure or a sudden impact like a bump if you have solid motor mounts, it could work itself off, leaving your return line free to spray fuel everywhere. We were insanely lucky that this happened after the motor had cooled down a little bit and we had just left a gas station, not in the middle of the freeway with a hot motor or on some back road where we had no access to help. We let everything cool down, got it reattached, zip tied the living hell out of it. And since then, despite never admitting fault, the manufacturer issued a second design, which I reused, which has a full locking sort of plate on the back preventing the fitting from ever backing itself off unless you physically remove it. Now that situation with fuel pumping onto the headers is one of the worst, and this Purple K extinguisher would have been the perfect thing to have in case a fire actually went up. Now story number three is the most recent, and also probably the one that you're most likely to have heard about if you've been following my channel for a while. About a year ago, somebody hit me on the way to the Summer Nationals, doing a pretty good amount of damage to the back frame of my truck in the bed, and hitting my fuel cell in the process. Now the fuel pump shut off right away, and obviously the engine shut off too, but even with that, damage to the fuel cell directly meant there was fuel leaking all over in a puddle behind my truck. And on top of that, because the battery box had been hit, there was the potential for a short. Of course, a puddle of fuel and a short is an insanely easy recipe for a fire and a good self-immolation, and I didn't want that. 
I didn't have an extinguisher with me, but if I did, especially in the situation where I'm looking at having located it, that could have been the difference between just a lot of damage and an absolute complete loss, as well as damage to the area and other people, myself, you never know. So with that, guys, like I said, that's the extinguisher I picked, the reason I picked it, where I mounted it, as well as a few personal experiences in which having an extinguisher probably would have been a good idea. Uh, this thing for, I think it was about 40 some dollars on Amazon, and I bought the two-strap bracket just because I was gonna be mounting it horizontally. Let's say under 60, 75 bucks. You have a simple way to at least reduce the risk or possibly put out a fire if something happens. This is a two and a half pound tank, so it's not huge. You're not gonna be able to fight a full-on Rager if it's already started and gotten out of control, but at the first signs of fire and hopefully preventing you from a huge amount of total loss damage. If you guys have high performance vehicles, definitely think about putting an extinguisher or some sort of fire suppression system in your car or truck. If you have something like a racing vehicle, there's a very good chance you already have a suppression system in it, like I mentioned with the Halon or Halotron. If you guys haven't checked out my build yet or follow me on social media, I'll have the links below. Please do that. Check out all the stuff on the Hatred Copter playlist. Use the hashtag Rebuild Everything on all your projects, cars, houses, whatever you're rebuilding, and I'll take a look at those posts. Like I said, check out everything else on the channel. I've got a lot more coming, more updates on the Hatred Copter, more from friends of the channel. I'm talking with my hands and waving like an idiot and rambling, so it's probably a good time to cut the video off here. As always, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next time, guys.